God bless you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us here tonight. I'm excited for this lesson that God has given to us. Stick with me. We're going to talk just a little while. I feel like God has something to share with us in this place at this time. Why don't you pray with me right now? God, we love you. We thank you for who you are, for the anointing of the living God that rests upon us, and for the people of God who are listening right now and those who will listen in the future. Speak unto our hearts, Holy Spirit, and grant that we will hear you. Make fallow now the grounds of our soul, that the seeds of good soul may be sown into our lives so that we might have them grow and us grow thereby. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank God for you. Yes, they are an amazing man, and y'all have blessed us one more time with the praise is what I do. Let me get into the lesson tonight, Living Faith in Stressful Times. This is part 26. Now, what I'm going to do tonight will be a little slightly different because I want to cover two chapters because the, the third chapter, the chapter that comes after these two, is the one I really want to dig into and spend more time in just in that chapter. But I wanted these two chapters combined because they are about the same thing and they're told twice over and the issues there are um, similar. And, and these chapters are the wrestling with the emotions that accompany abandonment, the emotions that accompany abandonment, the emotions that accompany um, our lives when we feel like we have been mistreated. Whenever an individual feels mistreated, whenever an individual feels as though they have not been treated according to what they think is uh, fairness, you end up with the kind of situation we have in, in this text. You end up with uh, a person that is wounded, and wounded people do weird things. They do strange things. And, and so I always check myself when I'm acting out of what I think is my character. I try to make sure I'm not acting out of a wound, acting out of something that is hurt in me because that hurt in me will cause me to be different than the individual I desire to be and even the individual I'm created to be so that whenever a person is wounded, you can see them act in a particular way. Some of the emotions of this particular text which leap out at us and that we have to deal with in our daily lives are the emotions of antagonism, which is hostility, anxiety, and anger. Antagonism, anxiety, and anger. And so we end up having to deal with those things, antagonism, anxiety, and anger. Now, when I say that, I mean when we are, a wounded person is going to press back, and what you're going to find is that hostility is going to be there, and then you're going to deal with the issue of anxiety, which is the anxiousness that goes with life when you're feeling like you don't know what's going to happen next. And then the anger that results on both sides. The anger from the person who's offering the antagonism and then the anger from the person who is the recipient of that antagonism. And it's a difficult situation. And one of the things that this text reveals to us is what Joseph did after the seven years of prosperity, after he has stored up the grain and the famine hits. Once the famine hits in its most difficult form, his brothers are forced to come to him for support. They're forced, and I'll talk about this in the message. I just want to set it up for you right now. They're forced to come to him for support. They don't know they're coming to him, but they're forced to come. They don't know it's their brother they're going to see. They're going to see the Egyptians. They have no way of even remotely thinking that it could be a relative of theirs because they're going to see the Egyptians. And when they get to that place to see them, they come into the situation and we're going to deal with this because he recognizes them, they don't recognize him. 
Now he's been away from them as long as they've been away from himself, but he recognizes them, they don't recognize him. And, and I ought to tell you this, he is in a position of prominence, power, and prestige. Let me say it again, prominence, power, and prestige. So he has the upper hand. And I want you to make sure you understand this. Remember, it's not how you treat people when you're down, rather how you treat people when you're up. It's not how you treat people when you're down. It's how you treat people when you're up. Because see, when you are down, you, 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 you might be kind to everybody because you're, you're groveling, things are not going well. But what will you do when you have, are able to say, I got the power? What will you do when you're able to say uh, that, that old movie with Tupac and those in it? What will you do when you're able to say, I got the juice? How will you handle the juice? How will you handle a situation where you're the head and not the tail? You know, um, I, I grew up in an area uh, where you would see uh, people who, which we back in the time of my youth, we used to call them winos. Uh, and I've known several winos. They, they drink too much, and they drink on the corner, and they drink in public, and you see them with a paper bag wrapped around a bottle, and they're drinking. And it's funny how two winos can get together, and they both broke, get enough to buy some Ripple, get enough to buy a fifth, get enough to buy themselves some, some Boone's Farm strawberry wine, whatever they could get. Uh, you know, uh, they get enough to buy that, that juice and it's amazing how when they both are in their stupor and in their stuff they'll share the corner of that bottle of liquor they'll they'll give you i got a taste you got a taste you got a taste and, and i came to believe that it's not how uh, you, you you do when you when you're down but how to do when you're up because see when you're broke it's easy to share the bottle. Prosperity can make you stingy. When you're broke, it's easy to share the bottle. It's easy to give your, uh, somebody else a corner. But when prosperity hits, it's somehow money changes, folks. You know, you, you've got to be careful not to let the money change you. Not to let your position change you. And here's what Joseph had to do. He had to work through this in his own being. Because he had been righteously, he has a righteous rationale for being upset. He has a righteous reason for wanting to get them. They got him. And they put him in prison. And they've got him. They sold him into slavery. They got him. They had messed his life up. He had a righteous reason to hate them, to dislike them, to want to get to them. And I want to say this to everyone listening to me now. The one thing you have to do is to stop rationalizing bad behavior. The, the thing that people don't realize is just because you have a reason to do something is not an excuse for doing it. It's not an excuse. You may have a reason to cuss everybody in the store out, but it's not an excuse to do it. You may have a reason to want to get back at all of your enemies, but it's not an excuse to do it. You have to live up to your best self and not become debased by the situation you're in so that you don't go down to someone else's level you live at your level and your level has a certain etiquette to it your level has a certain kind of, of carry to it you carry yourself with a certain level of dignity you've got to make sure that you don't allow yourself to get caught up in the vortex of self-adulation where you think you're better than somebody else. No, you're just up today. But up gets flipped upside down all the time. 
the bottom gets to the top quicker than you might think. And the top, sure enough, can sink. So no, never get it twisted. Always live your values. Amen. I'm with you, sis, brother. Whoop, there it is. Listen. Get this now. The flesh can easily desire revenge while the spirit brings life and abundance. The flesh can easily and, and most often desire revenge while the spirit brings life and abundance. And you've got to ask yourself, am I going to live my relationships out of my flesh or out of the spirit? Am I going to live my relationships out of my flesh or out of my spirit? Because see, it, it, you know, as Bernie Mac would say, certain things can happen and I, I may feel like I got to cut you because it's the rule. Am I going to live my life out of those worldly kind of thoughts or am I going to live my life in the spirit that brings life and abundance? See, some of us don't realize we are holding ourselves back by trying to hold people accountable for their behavior that only God can hold them accountable for. God can work on their conscience better than you can work on them with a stick. God can beat them in their, in their thinking better than you could ever beat them with your fist. And trust me, they can run away from your fist, but they can never run away from God. They can run away from your, your whooping, they can run away from your, your, your arrows of misfortune, but they can't run away from God. All right, let's get into this now. I've got eight things I want to bring before you before I close tonight. So get this night. There are eight textual movements that lead up to a rough reunion. Eight textual movements that lead up to a rough reunion. Eight textual movements that lead up to a rough reunion. Let, let's see if we can work through those movements because each of them teach us something. The first one is found in verses 1 through 5. And the first one is that we have here a frustrated father. A frustrated father. Now I'm in, I'm in Genesis uh, chapter 42, 1 through 5, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It says, now when Jacob, that is Israel, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you staring at one another in bewilderment and not taking action? He said, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some grain for us so that we may live and not die of starvation. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother, with his brothers. He said, I'm afraid that some harm or injury may come to him. So the sons of Israel came to Egypt to buy grain along with others who were coming for famine was in the land of Canaan. Get this, y'all. We have a frustrated father, and the reason he's frustrated is not that there's a famine, but that there's a solution to the famine. And his sons are looking around at each other instead of acting on the solution. Let me tell you something, and, and I do believe he, in this play, way he represents God to us. Sometimes God looks at us and say, I've given you an answer, and you keep praying for an answer. I've given you a way out, and you keep praying for a way out. I've given you a door, and you keep praying for a door. At some point, you have to get up and go to the door. At some point, you've got to receive the answer and act on it. And when the father looked at them, he was frustrated. He says, because you're staring at each other, you're glazing at each other, and if I, an old man, have heard about there's, there's food in Egypt, I know you heard. You should be coming to me 
to ask me what my opinion is. You should be asking me, Father, do you think we should go down to Egypt? You should be asking me, how much should we purchase in Egypt? You should be asking me, how much can we, how much resources do we have that we could bring in order to buy what we need for our families? I should not have to sit here and tell you the obvious. And I believe that one of the reasons people struggle to live their faith in stressful times is because they don't use the one thing that God gave them, attached it to them, connected it by their neck, put it under a dome of a skull and made it hard enough that it wouldn't easily break. They don't use their brain. So common sense is not common. And this frustrated father was frustrated because he said, hey, use some common sense. There's food in Egypt. Let's get to stepping. I want to suggest this again as I'm pushing through these eight things. I want to suggest this again. You need to ask God how best to act in the common sense he's given you. I, 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 I made this suggestion to, to someone and I'll say it to you. Wisdom is the principal thing. You need to get a hold of her and grab her like she's loved. You can never let her go. The word for wisdom is Sophia. Sophia is something you need. You need to say, God, I need your wisdom. I'm not going to let it go. I need wisdom. I need wisdom. I need wisdom. Some of us are walking around right now without wisdom. A lot of decisions we made, we take back if we can, be, if we can function in wisdom. Let me move on. Number two, number two. We have first a frustrated father, now we have a foretold fulfillment. A foretold fulfillment. Let's read a few verses here because I'm getting you caught up on the story as I go. I'm in verse 6, a foretold fulfillment. Now Joseph would rule over the land, and he was the one who, who sold grain to all the people of the land. And Joseph's half-brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but hiding his identity, he treated them as strangers and spoke harshly to them. He said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dream he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come with a malicious purpose to observe the under, under, undefended parts of our land. But they said, not so, my Lord. We, for your servants have only come to buy food. We are the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, you've come to see the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Please listen. The youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Notice now. Three things happen. Three things happen here. First of which is he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. He recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. It's amazing that he's looking at his brothers, these same nefarious characters who mistreated him and threw him in a pit, and one of which even probably threw a rock on his head. He's looking at them, coming looking for food. He recognizes them, but they don't know who he is. You know, it's, it's, it's funny where God will put you in a position where he'll make your enemies have to come back and look you in your face. And you'll be able to see them. Now, it's going to tell a lot about who you are by how you treat them. The second thing in the text, he was rough with them. He was rough with them. He, he knew who they were. He knew who their daddy was. He was one of them. But yet he was rough with them. 
and, and, and this roughness, this gruffness is, 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 is in two parts, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment uh, with the next point or so, but, but this roughness is his flesh reaching out to say something without saying anything. I just need to, I just need to mess with you. That's, that's the flesh. I need to say something about you. But the third piece in this, this section here is, he remembered the dream. While he's standing there, and they have now, the text says, they bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. That, that's, what it, that's what verse 6 says. They bowed down. That's the, that's the whole grain imagery. Those, those sheaves bowed down. To, to his. He said he remembered it while they were standing there. Let's do it again so you get this again now. He recognized them. After recognizing them, he's mean to them. While he's standing there, he remembers a dream, which means that he now thinks of himself for just a twizzle of a moment as superior, just as prophesied. You've got to understand something. Just because God elevates you, it does not mean God elevates you to lord it over anyone else. Always treasure in your heart with every blessing you get. I don't care if you get a new car, a new house, new shoes. I don't care if you just get a new toothbrush. Every blessing you get, you keep it in your heart, blessed to be a blessing. 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 Look here. How do, how do I know that? Because if God gives me extra income and I tithe off of it, it shows that I recognize I was blessed to be a blessing. You missed it. Went over your head. If I have more than I need, I recognize I've been blessed to be a blessing. I've been blessed to be a blessing. I, I, I didn't get this. This didn't all come in my direction just for me. God has blessed me to do something for somebody else. He remembered who he was and remembered the dream. And all of a sudden, he's looking at these brothers and he has now foretold fulfillment. What God had spoken had come to pass. And I want to say this to somebody right now. Somebody listening to me tonight, you, you've had word prophecy spoken over your life. Somebody has spoken into your spirit and you're saying to yourself, you're wondering when the word is going to come to pass. I want to tell you now, the word is about to come to pass. I'm speaking to someone right now prophetically in the name of Jesus. The word is about to come pass. And what God wants you to know, and the only reason you're listening to this word right now, is that when you receive what God's getting ready to do, that you know how to treat what God gives you so that you now act as a person of integrity, recognizing that the blessing you've received didn't just come to you. It was to be poured out. That's word for somebody right now. You're getting ready to get it. It's coming in. There's an inflow coming. I'm not talking about something that happened to someone in the past. I'm not talking about anything. I'm talking about somebody's getting ready to receive an inflow. And you need to remember this inflow that's coming. It's blessed to be a blessing. Come on back. I'm, I need to give that word. But the third movement in the text, the third movement in the text, the third movement in the text, the third movement in the text is that we have now a fractured family. A fractured family. And this fractured family is getting ready to be tested. It's getting ready to be tested. Whew. This is, this is important. It's getting ready to be tested. He's going to mess with them. Now, I'm not going to read this whole section coming up. It's verses 14 through 28, so allow me to skip around this section as I read it. <clears throat> but I want to give you this key nugget that you need in your mind. The harsh treatment, this, uh, that's the harsh treatment given to them by Joseph made them recognize their sin against their brother. Sometimes God will take even something bad 
and help us to make it good for our good. The harsh treatment opened up their eyes and then all of a sudden they could see so let me just read the first few verses and I'm going to jump down to verse 21. But Joseph said to them, as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies in this manner, you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your younger, youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you. Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are, you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. Oh, Joe, Joe. Joe. No, you didn't. He said, I only put them in three days. He had me in there for years. He put them in prison. He locked them up. It's only three days. But on the third day, I'm on verse 18 real quick. On the third day, he brought them out and he started talking to them. Now notice verse 19. If you are honest men, lest one of your brothers be confined in your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses. He says, okay, I'm going to test how honest you are. Leave one brother here and you all go take the provisions back to the family. Now that's, that's kind of that's cold. That's kind of cold. Because it seems like he's going to keep a hostage. Now watch verse 21. Jump down to verse 21. Verse 20 says, bring your youngest brother or, or, or this one's going to die. Verse 21 says, then they said to one another, we are truly guilty. Now wait a minute. He's just talked to them about going to bring their brother and bring him back. But it, they respond with what the thoughts of their hearts are. We know the thoughts of Joseph's heart is that he recognized them. He realized the dream had been fulfilled and they're bowing to him. He's been rough words. But now we hear the thoughts of these brothers' hearts. Verse 21 says, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you would, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them by, through an interpreter. And verse 24 is one of the most powerful verses in this text. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Hold that line. You're going to need it later on. He turned himself away and all he could do was cry. Now, get this here. Get this here. You got to get this now. With t he's testing them. They are fractured. He, they've got brothers that are turning and arguing with each other about their actions of the past. He's got issues going on. And now the coup d'etat of all, the, 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 the thing that just leaps out to the top is he said, verse 24, after he got the weeping, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. In other words, he took a hostage. Now, there's several reasons why he takes the hostage. One of which could be that he takes Simeon as a hostage to guarantee that they will have to come back to Egypt. That they won't try to find food somewhere else. So, guarantees they're coming back. Other reason could be that he takes a hostage so that he can guarantee to see his brother Benjamin. But there's another reason that the Jewish scholars look at with this text, which I find extremely interesting. Because Simeon was the one that wanted to put him in the pit and was the one that talked of stoning him in the pit. Because Simeon and his brother were the ones that killed the Shechemites. And because he had a reputation for violence, if there was one brother you needed to bring under subjection so that the other brothers didn't act a fool, 
it would have been Simeon. So he put Simeon in prison to keep Simeon from turning it out. Because if you bind the strong man, it puts everybody else down. Ooh, that's deep, that's deep, that's deep. I know I'm going deep, y'all. Stay with me tonight. I'm not done yet. I got more stuff to go. Listen, he put Simeon in prison. Now, you got to remember now, this is not a deep prison. He's not, he's not in a concentration camp. He's not in labor camp. He's in the same kind of prison that Joseph was in himself, which means he's probably got some freedom and movement because he's going to need to hang out for a while because they're not coming back immediately. But they will have to come back. Fourth movement in the text, and I'm, half, I'm halfway home when I get to this one, is familial favoritism. Familial favoritism. Now what makes this, this section here important is that after all he has said to them and as mean as it appears he has been, he blesses their socks off. He blesses them like he thought that, that Jesus was coming back and right away. The Messiah was coming right there. Listen, he blesses them. Oh my God. He blesses them. He commanded that they fill their sacks with grain and give them back their money. I'm in verse 25, those reading along. Then he loaded their donkeys with grain and that they depart, and he sent them back with their money restored and their grain in place. But watch this. Because they're now under the spirit of conviction, the favoritism doesn't feel like favoritism. It feels like there's something wrong. Let me, let me help somebody here. When God blesses you and you know you don't deserve it, you need to recognize it's mercy. Y'all didn't get that. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. When God blesses you and you know you don't deserve it, it's mercy. But because they knew of the depth of the sins that they had committed for them, they believed that the blessing was a curse from God. It forced them to contemplate divine judgment upon them so that at the end of verse 28, they're asking, what is this that God has done to us? Let me help you here. God is going to bless you. And you don't have to worry about how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And you don't have to be afraid of what God does when he does it. And you don't have to wonder about whether or not you deserve it, because in truth, none of us deserve any of the blessings we have, and especially some of us online right now who know we have fallen short of the glory of God. They were blessed, but they were fearful under divine judgment. They said, what is this that God has done to us? Okay. I'm at number five, the fifth movement. The fifth movement. Yes, yeah, right. So he scared them. They were scared. They were scared. And they should have been. When you, when you act up like that, you should be scared. The fifth movement. The fifth movement in the text. I told you I'm taking you a long way around. Amen. Mercy suits my case. Amen. I'm with you, sis. Show up. Listen. The fifth movement is that their faults are framed. Their faults are framed. Their faults are framed. Now recognize something. Get this in your mind. Get this in your mind. Yes, it. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Uh, listen, listen. Joseph had changed, but the brothers are unchanged, and they are tightly connected to their past moral failure. Let me do this again. Joseph had changed, but the brothers are unchanged, and tightly connected to their past moral failures. When you don't change, 
When you know you've done wrong and you don't seek forgiveness, you, you don't change, you are walking through life with a proverbial ball and chain because you are attached to your last failure. You are attached to the guilt of it. Let me, let, me, let me explain this thing about guilt. See, when I have been forgiven, guilt is removed. The debt is pardoned. What has been done is taken off my case. But when I'm walking in unforgiveness, I still carry the debt of guilt and the debt I owe to the sin I've committed. So they're connected to their moral failure. Watch this. What you do follows you until you set it right with God. What you do follows you until you set it right with God. Now, I know I'm talking to somebody right now, so let me say it to you up front. You got some stuff to set right. There's some things you got to get straightened out with God. You got to get some stuff straightened out, and maybe with some other people. But you got to make sure that you don't have junk following you because you're somebody right now, you've got a whole parcel of stuff, and you're wondering why you're being held back. Listen to me. Get this in your spirit. Here, here it is. Here it is. Even the bounty of Egypt couldn't keep the past from being prominent on their minds. Even the bounty of Egypt, all the food, all the grain, all the stuff they got couldn't keep the past from being heavy on their minds. Let me pick it up. Verse 29. They got to explain stuff to Jacob now. When they came to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them, saying the man who was the Lord of the land spoke harshly to us. He took us for spies in the land, but we told him we are honest men. He goes through all those things. And the, the man to the Lord of the country said to us, I'm in verse 33, by this test I will know that you're honest. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take grain for your starving household and go. Verse 34, bring your youngest brother to me. Then I will know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. Then I will return your imprisoned brother back to you, and you may trade and do business in the land. And then they tell him what happened. They said, man, we got money. We got bundles of food. And, and, and Jacob, their father, verse 36, said to them, you have bereaved me by causing the loss of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would to take Benjamin from me. So now everything's topsy-turvy. You, you have this situation where they begin to frame out all of the issues that have happened. They frame out what is going on in their situation. And as they, as they look at this, this picture here of the faults that they've had and the failures they've had, you have Jacob standing there saying, look, if you take Benjamin and you bring him down there and something happens to him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol. That is the place of the dead in sorrow. In other words, you'll kill me. You'll kill me. Now, what we have here now is a glimpse at the framework around which this story is really residing. The sins of the past have come back to haunt them. Their brother, who they think is dead, is controlling the narrative. One brother now, Simeon, is in, as a hostage. And they're waiting to meet Benjamin. And in their minds and in the mind of the father, it is simply this. I've already lost. I've already lost two sons. Simeon is lost to me. I've lost two sons. I've already lost two sons. And now you want to ask me to lose a, a third. You, I've already lost two sons. Now you ask me to lose a third. 
This is the end of chapter 42 where he's dealing with this mind-blowing situation. And chapter 42's end starts the shift into this new relationship dynamic between Joseph and his brothers. But the shift can't happen unless the father releases Benjamin. And the only way he can do that, it has to be an act of faith. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the cliff note version because for time's sake, so get, get, get with me for a moment. Here's the cliff note version. All the grain gets eaten up. So now they've gone now a significant period of time and they've used everything they bought back. So this ought to tell you something. <laughs> Those other brothers that were back at the house, they were like, Sim, hope you can hang out, brother, because we are in no hurry to come back there. That man crazy. We ain't coming back to get you. Man, I just hope you can make it. I mean, you stuck like Chuck. I'm just, hey, man, look. Hang in there, bud. Peace out. We love you. Ooh, heart starts with it. Listen, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to go here and feed my wife and my kids. We're going to make it. And there's a moment that happens where they finish eating everything and Judah says to them, go back and buy some more. And they look at Judah like you have three heads. Verse three, but Judah said to him, the man representing, is representing Pharaoh, uh, sol solemnly and sternly warned us. So when Israel says go back, Judah says, man, you, you gotta be kidding. He says, you will not even see my face again unless you you bro your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we'll go down to Egypt and buy food. But if you will not send them, we will not go down there for the man said to us. He says, I can't go down there without Benjamin with us. I'm going, I'm going somewhere, y'all. They continue talking. Judah is so, is so intent that he wants to make this happen, they keep talking. They keep talking. They try to talk their father into it. They try to get his attention. They want him to do something. They want him to go with him. Now watch this. Their father comes through. But I want you to get this. In verse 13, Verse 13, I'm reading again in the Amplified Version. I'm in chapter 43 for those who follow me. It says, take your brother Benjamin also and get up and go to the man. And watch what he says. And may God Almighty grant you compassion and favor before the man so that he will release to you your other brother Simeon and Benjamin. Now stay there. I want to give you what we have here is a faith-filled father. And by faith, I mean his trust in God because he says it's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. I've already told you what I want. I do not want, I don't want this to happen. I don't want you to take him but if you think you have to take him, take him. May God give you favor. May God grant compassion and favor before you. And notice what he says. He says that your other brother, Simeon and Benjamin, he says, and as for me, verse 14, if I am bereaved of my children, Joseph, Simeon, and Benjamin, I am bereaved. I'm leaving it in the hands of God. I'm asking God to grant compassion for you. 
I'm asking God to grant favor for you because as God grants you compassionate favor, he's granting it unto me. And if that means I'm left in grief, then I'm going to be left in grief. If that means I'm bereaved when this is over for trusting in God's word, I'm going to be bereaved. If God has made a promise that my seed is going to continue his legacy in the earth realm from my father and my father's father, if I'm bereaved, then I'm bereaved, but I'm going to trust that God is going to work it out. I'm going to trust. And if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. This, I think, is one of the most powerful texts in the Bible. Because at some point in your life, you're going to have to act on faith. And it's not faith if you can see it. You're going to have to believe that God's going to keep his word even when you don't know how he's going to do it. You're going to have to step out and trust God to be God even when you don't know where you're stepping to. You're going to have to say, God, this is in your hands. And he says, and if I believed, then so let it be. It must be the will of God. But I believe compassion and favor are going with you because I prayed over you now. I'm praying over you. Now, I've got two more movements and just a little bit of time left. And I want to make sure I get these in before I close tonight. I hope you all are hanging with me. I know this is a deep lesson. We're on a, a heavy rotation here. But stay with me. Stay with me. The seventh thing is, while the father is faith-filled, while the father's walking by faith, trusting God, an old man believing in God, believing God's word, the seventh movement in the text goes back to the brothers because we have a frightened fraternity. A frightened fraternity. See, they come up, they're scared from the beginning. 43, 30, 43, 18 says, now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. They were already scared. They were worried the moment they were brought into Joseph's house. They were worried. They were scared. Verse 16 says, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, bring the men into the house and kill an animal. And make a meal ready for the men who will dine with me at noon. So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men of Joseph's house to Joseph's house. The men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house and expecting the worst. They said it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time we came that we are being brought in so that he may find a reason to accuse us and assail us and take our, us, our, us as slaves and seize our donkeys. They are frightened and they don't know. They just walked into a blessing. They don't realize that they walked into the house of, a, of their brother. They don't realize they walked into a favorite place. But because their spirits are not in a place with God, they only can rely on their flesh to intuit the situation. And their flesh intuits the situation out of its own selfish mindset, out of its own mindset that thinks the worst instead of the best. And some of us are in a position right now that even when God is blessing us, we keep thinking the worst. Something bad is going to happen. It's going to go wrong. It's not going to be good. The trick of the enemy is to make you afraid even when God is blessing you. The trick of the enemy is to make you think God is not real even when God has been really working on your behalf. You have to realize that you're walking in Fear is walking away from your faith and you are expending emotions on fear that could be generating joy and peace and happiness and instead you're functioning in the spirit of fear. But God has not given us the spirit of fear but of love and of power 
and of a sound mind. I know that's New Testament, but it applies in everyday life. Let me tell you something. The brothers felt they were under divine judgment. They felt they were under divine judgment. And it's understandable. They done some judge worth, judgment worthy things. And they felt they wanted divine judgment. They thought, they thought because they, they hadn't done the right thing. Back in chapter 42, verse 28, they thought that the money in their sacks meant that they were, were, were under judgment. Their hearts failed them. 42, 28 says their hearts failed them. And they were afraid saying one another, what is this God's done? Let me tell you something. Fear is the opposite of faith and it is the opposition of faith. It keeps you from trusting God to do the extraordinary and the exceedingly great in your life. Finally, I can't deal with this like I want to, but here's the last point. Notice something. Joseph goes and is sold into slavery. He's sold to Potiphar. He's went to prison. And in all of those movements, there's not one single point where we see an emotional response from him to this plight. He doesn't break down and start crying when they, when they sell him off in slavery. He doesn't break down and start crying when they throw him in the pit. He doesn't break down and start crying when he gets part of his house. He doesn't break down and start crying in prison. There's no weeping, no emotion, nothing. Isn't that odd? But watch this. I don't have time to do it all. I'm out of time, y'all. But watch this. Verse 27 says, he asked them about their well-being and said, is your father well of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And the answer, your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed down their heads before Joseph in respect. And he looked up and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's only other son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And, jo and, and Joseph said, God be gracious to you and show you favor, my son. Then Joseph hurried out of the room because his heart was deeply touched over his brother and he sought privacy to weep. So he entered his chamber and wept. I, I, I gotta stop here, but I, this is where I'll come back and begin the next segment. Watch this, y'all. There was a famine of food in the land. It was a famine of food. But Joseph was suffering from a famine of family. And the only thing that could make him emotional, the only thing that could mess with his head out of all he'd been through was the sight of his beloved brother was hearing his brothers talk about him and what they, how they mistreated him. When family was being touched, he was touched. And there's nothing like a famine of family. What Joseph needed, they needed food. He needed family. They needed food. He needed family. He needed his family to be restored. He needed the reunion to happen. He needed God to bless his household. He needed something different. Let me tell you something. How do I know he needed family? That's why he was so willing to take his wife. That's why he named his children after his sorrows of forgetting what he had been through and of the new experiences that were to come. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, you got to understand that you have to realize that at some point, 
you need to find a way to reconcile with family. Because after all, through divine assignment, they're yours. And even if they are not all they're supposed to be, they're still family. They ain't got nothing but their family. And that's why I think it's so important that the church be like family. And we love each other like family. Because family is all we got. God bless you, saints. I love you all the love of the Lord. Pray you take note to this word. I'm coming back. I'm not finished. You can tell I'm heading somewhere. This is the word of God for the people of God. You ought to say thanks be to God. Amen. God bless you, saints. I'm getting ready to get offline. I thank you so much for joining me here tonight. And I want you to know that whenever you hear me teaching, preaching, I'm always trying to give you what God has laid on my heart. And I pray you receive the word of God from me. And I want to make sure that you hear the word from me. Each one of you now, I want you to know that I love you with the love of the Lord. And you can join us here if you are online and you want to become a partner with us in this ministry. Email us, text us us, call us, get in touch with us. We'd love for you to be a part of the Shiloh family and we already care for you because you're here. You're here because God wanted you to be here. Amen. And I praise God for you joining with us in this moment here in this place. And let me go move a little further here. Each one of you, please join me in giving tonight. Amen. God bless you. Give us unto the Lord. Uh, we have uh, found our two places to give to uh, for our Haiti fund. We've sent off money this week to the first fund, and we will send off money next week to the fund um, that's uh, our dear sister. Sister uh, uh, um, Winston, uh, her her father is in Haiti, and he's doing ministry work there in Haiti. So we're going to send money to him. We know him; he's a great man of God. I did have the pleasure of meeting him when he was in the states, and I'm so grateful. And I know him to be a, a sound man of God. And he has friends that are in the direct district of those that were a part of the earthquake and he's going to sow into them so we're going to channel our monies into people we know that are doing work with boots on the ground so we want to thank God for you I thank you for blessing Reverend Jackie last week so continue to give to the benevolent fund that we can give to others you know there are three ways to give cash app give Lafay, or you can mail it in so mail in or give by give Lafay your gifts to the Benevolent Fund. I promise you the deacons are doing a fantastic work. The deacon and deaconess of our church are always ministering to everyone they can. Well, I love all of you. So grateful to have you online. Please keep praying for each other. Pray for our bereaved families. I ask that you lift up in your prayers. Deacon and deaconess Daniels, hold them up, undergird them before the Lord, and pray for one another. Each of you it's not any one person. It's not whether I call your name out or not. All of us are going through something. So pray for each other. Amen. I'll pray for you and you pray for me. Amen. Let's keep praying for each other. I, I didn't see that message. This is living faith. Amen. In stressful times. This is part 26. So I pray that you uh, will definitely get into this. Amen. I think somebody's telling me I need to put this in a book. <laughs> I, I hope God blesses us. Amen. And uh, this is worth worthwhile. Thank you so much. I pray you all are listening. I pray God has given you something from this. And may God bless you. If I left anything out, amen, amen. If I left anything out, please charge it to my head and not to my heart. I love you all with the love of the Lord. God bless you. And uh, hey, look, let me just also say this. Go Connecticut Sun. Amen. They want them to win tonight. They're on at 8 o'clock, so let's go celebrate. God bless you till we meet again. That's right, Mother Wiggins. God be with you till we meet again. And you know what I do? I got a one-word benediction for you. You know what it is. Shalom.